Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Carl Vilakova of the Monmouth University Urban Coast Institute and the Mid-Atlantic Ocean Data Portal team. Thanks for joining today's How Tuesday webinar on the portal's Automatic Identification System, or AIS, vessel traffic maps. For a, a good several years, the portal housed AIS maps covering 2011 through 13, and they consistently rank toward the top of the most frequently used layers on the site. We recently took a good leap forward and added maps for, for 2015, 16, and 17, which basically gets us caught up, and the plan and hope is to keep rolling them out um, each year as, as early as possible. Our latest AIS data also includes new maps for three new categories of vessels and a new methodology which we'll um, cover in just a little bit. Uh, today, I'll give you a quick walk through all of the AIS maps that we have in Marine Planner, plus a peek at a new tool that we're working on that will help you animate and toggle through monthly vessel traffic maps, which aren't online yet. Then I'm going to toss it over to my friend Doug Simpson, who is a recreational boating safety specialist with the Coast Guard's 5th District Waterways Management Branch in Virginia. You might even hear from his dog Kylo Ray because he's working from home today, and um, I've heard her barking in the background a little bit, and that's where that will be coming from if you do hear it. Um, but really, the, the things that Doug sees when he looks through um, AIS and, and points things out on, you know, with the track lines are really fascinating. And today he's going to share some of his insights and talk about how he's using AIS data and how it can help generally with decision making. A couple of quick notes before we get started. This webinar is being recorded for the benefit of those who couldn't join us today at, at this time. Um, I will have it posted by the end of the week. Um, you can find that on the portal blog or on the portal's webinars page <clears throat> or on our YouTube page. Also, if you can keep questions to um, the end, that would be great, unless there is something that um, you see that you don't understand that you'd like some clarification on right away. Go ahead and, and type that into the chat, and um, we'll get to it as soon as we can. And finally, <clears throat> I'd like to take a moment to offer some thanks to our partners on the Marine Cadaster and Northeast Portal teams, whose work was essential in making these maps possible. Um, the same can be said for um, the many agencies and other stakeholders who provided input that helped develop these products. And I see that a lot of those people are on the phone, and thank you for joining. Um, while not presenters, Daniel Martin from NOAA and Nick Napoli from the Northeast are on the line in case anyone has any questions that come up about those sites, or if I need to phone in a lifeline for something that I'm stumped on, um, you, you guys may get that call. But anyway, to get started, a little bit of background on AIS. Um, since 2002, large vessels operating in U.S. waters have been required to carry AIS technology, which is kind of like easy transponders for the ocean. They send automatic, automated signals to nearby ships, receivers on land, and satellites in space, and share info like, a ship's identity, its course, its speed. There are a lot of sites um, online that provide real-time information that you can look at and see what's on the ocean right now, where you're looking, you know, if you're at the beach and you see something interesting. Um, we and our partners take full year's worth of that data, which is collected by the Coast Guard, and create maps that show where the vessel con concentrations were the highest and lowest for those periods. And that kind of cuts to the purpose of uh, the portals themselves versus, a, uh, say, a real-time site that, that um, has that kind of data. Um, from an ocean planning perspective, we're most interested in the overall trends that can be used to inform long-term strategic decisions. So if you're in, in say, um, Doug's shoes and you're trying to analyze a traffic lane off the coast, it's not as meaningful necessarily to know where one boat is at any given moment. Um, they may never go back there again. Um, it, it's, it's much more helpful to get that 
step back and, and look at the overall trends and see you know, where things are busy, where a lot of boats are um, all of the time, and understand those patterns. So what you see in our maps are hot colors that indicate where vessel concentrations were highest and cooler colors that note where the traffic was less intense. And specifically, the reds represent 100-meter grid cells where there were more than 500 transit counts, while the darkest blues show areas with 10 or less. Um, and you'll, you'll see that on the maps in just a few minutes. Um, but for a, a really good resource on all of the background information for AIS, one that Doug recommended that I was looking at uh, this morning is navsend.uscg.gov. And um, that uh, has a really deep well of information. So now on to the portal. Um, before I jump into Marine Planner, I just want to point out a couple of things for people who may not be as acquainted with all the stuff on the portal um, related to AIS. This page right here, which we call the uh, portal blog, is a good place where you can find information about any of the new significant tools or data sets that debut. So for example, this one right here has more information about what we're talking about today. And you'll want to keep an eye on this page in um, the weeks ahead as more information um, keeps coming online. And it, it's a really good resource that can tell you how to find these things, how to use them, what exactly they are, and just all of the um, frequently asked question kind of stuff. You can also look at the Ocean Stories section, which is kind of our half um, digital magazine, half um, story map type platform. And there are some good ones about AIS in here, including this one, Ocean Story 4, which was a profile I did on a guy named Guy Thomas, who I met at um, Capitol Hill Ocean Week a couple of summers ago. And he is the father, basically, of satellite AIS. And I did a profile on him and talked about the um, roots of it, which basically um, go back to 9-11 as a security measure. But AIS quickly grew in use for all kinds of things that um, the public and private sector found for it such as maritime safety, ocean planning, environmental protection, fishing fleet monitoring, and even around the world, preventing piracy. Hopefully not something we have to worry about too much off the mid-Atlantic coast anymore. Um, so here is the main marine planner uh, opening, which automatically goes to the ocean base map. And you're going to find all of our AIS data under maritime. So if you scroll down, you start to see it 2011, 12, 13, right on down through 17. And these last three, uh, these last four are actually the newest. And um, I'll explain that in a second. The first iteration of AIS data that we had had five categories on it, all vessels, cargo, passenger, um, tankers, and tug-and-tow vessels. And with these, if you look at the legend, they used um, a, a relative density scale. And that is something that changed with the more recent stuff, which started in um, 15, which goes to an actual you know, vessel transit count uh, scale up here of greater than 500. And part of that was the reasoning behind that was that um, we heard from our stakeholders that um, it, it was just easier to do um, a, a, an, an actual count so that you can make more of apples and apples kinds of comparisons between things. Like if you look at, if you were to check all of these, they have different scales. So there's not that many um, tug-and-tow vessels, for example. So for them, what would con be considered a, a red line um, would be one thing. But then if you looked at um, another one, you know, it would be 100 through 436. 
Another one would be 100 through 7,156. And so that can, it, it can make things seem um, like they're not. It can tell stories that aren't necessarily um, what they would seem. For example, um, you might see a red line for a tug and tow vessel on a river, but it might only be um, a few dozen vessels versus a red line for something else, which could be thousands. Anyway, so that, that was changed with the more recent versions. We also went back and did the same for 2013. So you now see we've got two sets, AIS vessel density and AIS vessel transit counts. Um, we left that old one there because we knew that some people had done and were working on some research that still um, used that. So we wanted to keep that on there so people could continue using it into the near future. With the latest versions, though, 15, 16, and 17, we have um, not only the, the original five categories, but we've, we've added a few, notably, and let me um, close out of here and clear the deck, start fresh. We have uh, fishing, which is very interesting. We have other vessels, which are um, vessels that don't fit neatly under the other categories that we have. For example, here at Monmouth University, <clears throat> we have three research vessels that all uh, carry a AIS, and um, they would be reflected in this. Um, you might see certain government um, uh, boats, uh, I, I think state police boats, and others like that would fall under there. We have pleasure craft sailing vessel transit counts. Zooming in on that, you can see. And um, yeah, I think that's, the, I, I got all of the, the ones that we had there. So altogether, we have 44 different ones, different map layers, that is. There will be several to come in the near future because we're going to be adding our new toggle tool and animation tool. So this is our staging site. We're testing it out right now. But when it goes live, you're going to be able to find this stuff mixed in with all of the regular AIS data. So you see 15 and 16 transit counts. Then you see under here 16 monthly data sliders then 17 transit counts, and then 17 monthly data sliders. So I'm going to click on that and give you a peek. So this takes a, a, a few seconds to load. And the reason why is what you're actually seeing happen here is it's taking um, 12 data layers, basically, one for each month, for each of these different um, months. So you're, you're talking about I mean, for each of these different uh, vessel types and all of that and queuing it up. So it's, it's a lot of different layers that it's putting up in the back end. But, you know, for, for my browser, it took about 20 seconds right there. What you see here are on the top, the months, and on the bottom, the different vessel types. So if you click on the play button, right now it's automatically set to the all vessels transiting, uh, it's going right through. Doug, can you see that okay? Carl, I sure can. And okay. I'm really excited for this thing to go functional. We all are, yep. So not only can you do that, you can actually manually um, toggle it through. And let's say you want to see what August looks like. And then you want to skip ahead and just see what December looks like. You can see. But then you can come down to the bottom and see, for example, what fishing vessels only looks like and turn it on. As you can see, it, it kind of thins out over the winter, then comes um, the warmer months, and you see a lot of, of action coming out of certain ports. And we can do another one. Um, Here's a, a pretty seasonal one, the 
um, sail and pleasure boat. Click on that. So you've seen the winter months, it's really down to very little. And then come the spring, it picks up. Summer is very busy. Starts to tail off at the end of the fall and then get very slow. So it's really interesting when you do these comparisons and see how this data can help tell stories. And speaking of that, I'm going to throw it over to Doug now, who will tell you some stories about the things that he sees when he goes through this data. Thanks, Carl. And I'd like to echo your, um, your thanks to the Marine Cadaster team, um, Dan and Megan, and, and, and as well as, as Nick from um, the Northeast Data Portal. Uh, for, for working on this, um, getting the updated AIS data up and out and, and um, usable by us end users. Uh, it's a great tool and, and great product, and thanks again for all the hard work. Um, the, the, can you see my screen? Carl? I can. Right now I see the, um, the calendar to. page item. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. So um, from this page, for anybody who's brand new, if you, if you guys were here, um, just go to the map, click there. Here's, um, here's the, the default portal page. Uh, to zoom in or out, the plus button zooms you in. It's in the bottom right, minus the button zooms you out. If you want to change your view, you just click on the screen and, and drag it to where you want it to go. If you want to change the base map, you just click on the base map square. You click nautical charts if you want nautical charts. You can click the ocean base map, which is the default. You can go to um, a street view, sort of a map, that kind of thing. Um, also, if you are logged in and you want to follow along, so if you want to follow the webinar on one screen and follow and do what I'm doing um, on the other screen, if you go to the, if you join the AIS data demonstration group, click on that, join it. Um, I've got a couple of bookmarks. bookmarks that will show up um, that you'll be able to click on to get you where you need to go, and a couple of drawings that you'll be able to, to um, add if you'd like. So, so there's that. All right, so let's go back to the map. Um, and we'll go to my planner. We'll go to the first book map. Um, oh, I haven't shared this one. Let me share this. All right. Shared, and then let me share this one. Here we go. Okay, here it is. This is what we were looking at before, but it's a satellite view. This is the, the Mid-Atlantic um, uh, uh, Coastal Zone Area, um, and, and, and it really is uh, Coast Guard 5th District centric. You'll see Long Island at the top, which is just above our zone, and you'll see kind of the, the North Carolina, South Carolina border down at the very bottom, which is the, the southern reaches of our zone. The first area I'd like to take you is to the very bottom, down here um, at the Cape Fear River mouth, um, Frying Pan Shoals area. So we'll go to AIS Demonstration 2. Um, and what you see here is uh, the entrance to Cape Fear River. And this is Frying Pan Shoal because it's shaped like, well, We'll just call it frying pan shoal. And um, uh, what we'll do is walk through uh, the different um, vessel types uh, from 2017 to kind of get an idea of what vessels come and go from the Cape Fear River and, and where do they go. So I'd like to start with the bigger ones first. And so let's go ahead and take a quick look at tankers. All right, so they, they come and go. And, and what's happening here, you see them coming in through what's called the traffic separation scheme. Now, um, if we had the chart view up, you'd be able to see that, but we don't. We've got the satellite up. They come in um, basically running a, a northerly route to get to the, the federal channel that will take them up to Cape Fear River, up to Wilmington, um, or, and places in between uh, the mouth and Wilmington. And then on the way out, they take this traffic separation scheme uh, on, a, on, a, on a dog leg to the southwest, and then they hit the open ocean and they go where they need to go. So that's what tankers look like. And, and you can see 
their, their, their approach is pretty much off the screen. So we're not going to really bother with tankers for this. Um, for this. Now let's take a look at cargo vessels next. And you can see that um, we've got a, a nice kind of a, uh, this is, I would say, this is kind of the limit of our approach. We've got some onesies and twosies over here. But I'd like to go ahead and, and kind of capture their nearest approach here. Um, so what I did in my planner is I uh, made a little drawing. We'll call it Cape Fear Cargo Vessels 2017. We'll turn that on. That's kind of how, where I kind of define the approach. But if we're looking at where do cargo vessels seem comfortable coming and going as they approach Cape, uh, the Cape Fear, I kind of thought, well, this might be something that we could look at here. All right, well, let's go back to some data. And um, we'll shut off cargo vessels. And let's take a look next at tugs and tows. Next kind of, and, and, and you can see that they, they, they're all over the place. But there's two kind of approaches um, from the east-northeast that they use here and, and kind of here. So um, on the planner, here's where uh, there's my tug and toes right here. So it looks like kind of kind of here and kind of here. All right, um, that's tugs and toes. Hey, Doug, just curious, where, where it's not, sh I, I see there's no tug and tow traffic right there on, on that actual um, shoal area. Is that strictly a depth thing? It is. It is. And in fact, um, the, where these vessels go helps us understand, um, like, this is frying pan shoal, and, then, and the name shoal is, you know, there's, there's not room for you to navigate here, so you have to go somewhere else. So we can see where people are using the pass-throughs, and that might help us focus on where do we need to make sure good navigation systems exist, right? So, um, so that's kind of the point of maybe as a waterways manager, I'm, wa I'm watching where, where are the, the boundaries of where people think it's safe to go. And that helps me make sure that our, you know, as, a, as a waterways manager, our navigation systems in those areas. So um, let me, I'm going to have to refresh. Um, and this is just a little trick for people who are new to the, to the data portal. Sometimes um, if you think you've shut off data and it hasn't turned off, well, and you can go to your active and just see, and it shows that it's off. So you just kind of have to hit the refresh button. And it'll go to the default, but then it'll bring you back to where you were. And then you can go to your active layers, shut them off. There we go. All right, good. And now I'm going to shut off my drawing because I don't want to taint this. All right. Let's go to um, let's go to fishing vessels next and take a look at where the fishing vessels go. And similarly to um, the tubs and toes, I thought that would shut it off now. There we go. Let's come down. Okay, good. Um, Here's, they, they kind of make this kind of winged uh, thing. So, so here's what here's what I defined for um, fishing. So we've got this, so you know that they're coming and going there. They're using this cross through just like the tugs and toes did. Let's shut that off. Let's take a quick look at passenger and sailing vessels, or, or, or pleasure craft and sailing vessels. And they um, also follow this kind of a, an area. So here's how I defined uh, those guys. Recreation. All right. So let me see if I can shut off all the data again. Other craft are off. Fishing vessels. Nope, I can't get them off. That's OK. What we're going to do is layer. No, we'll hit the, I'm going to refresh. It'll come back real quick. All right, great. And now let's go ahead and layer what we drew. So we've got our um, tugs, recreational boats, fishing boats, cargo. So 
So we've got this area in here was a critical path through. It looked kind of like this was a, a boundary layer, and this area is a boundary layer. So if we turn on our chart, we can actually see, yep, this is the shoal where people can't go. And, and look, we've got aids here to help people pass through. Um, and, and, and as they approach from here, they can see the aids to navigation. As they approach from here, they can keep um, off the shoal coming through and kind of line up and go through this way. The tugs and toes, that the outer boundary for the tug and toe, they're going around this shoal this way. And then finally, we've got this aid to navigation out here that helps um, that, that um, closest approach for cargo vessels coming in. So it kind of looks um, like our, you know, what the data shows us is reflecting the navigation system we've got uh, right now, and it looks like it seems to be serving things okay, right? So that's kind of a general, um, as, a, as a waterway per person and kind of manager, how uh, the AIS can help us, yep, are, we, are, are people following what we've put out sort of a thing. So that's, that's just one use. Um, and that's kind of uh, the bread and butter for my um, waterways management, um, for the waterways management shop I work in. Um, so that's, that's, that's one way to use the data. And then let's go um, to a different view. Go to view number three. See if it brings it up. Oh. There we go. Okay, here we are, a little bit further north. So this is the Cape Hatteras Inlet. And you'll see uh, there's this traditional ferry route that go, brings people from Hatteras down to Ocracoke. And, it, and as I talk, you can see my mouse moving, right? Okay, let's hope so, because I'm trying to show you guys stuff. All right, so what happens when storms come through to our kind of shallowed and and, and susceptible to movement um, uh, 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 inlets. Well, where people can go shifts and changes. And um, if you've got a ferry system, the cost to operate, if, if instead of being able to go kind of straight across, you have to take large loops to go back and forth, um, could significantly increase. So let's go ahead and turn on the data for passenger vessels. And, and this is um, one, of the, one of the things I really want to thank um, Nick and, and the Marine Kid Astro, or whoever um, worked on the portal side of bringing the data down to North Carolina, thanks so much, because now we've got this data available on the Marco um, portal. But when we go to the passenger vessel counts, and that's where ferries come in, you'll see that no longer can they go almost point to point to run their route. They have to add significant time and distance um, going back and forth. So. It, it, Simple things like being able to show, okay, here's here's what it adds, um, but the, and you can tell people the numbers, and it might not make sense as much as showing the picture. The picture paints a thousand words, and so the data can help you when you're talking with um, decision makers for you know, budgetary stuff. Do we dredge? Do we not dredge? That kind of thing. So, uh, and and again, it's um, you know it's not the end all be all, and it's uh, rudimentary, but at least it's a starting point and a place where you can um, show people, all right, here's what it used to be, here's what it is now, what do we need to do to, to fix it, or is this our new normal? That sort of thing. All right, so let's go to demonstration four, a little bit further up. What you see here is the ocean's base map with the um, uh, BOEM wind re renewable BOEM active renewable energy lease areas up. And we're, we're not yet in active wind energy era, but we're in the planning for it era. And you can see um, that we've got a couple of wind energy areas leased off the Virginia North Carolina coast. Um, and so I'd also like to show you how ships right now um, what systems we've got for vessels, big vessels, coming and going um, at the entrance of the Chesapeake Bay. And then I'd like to show you um, Department of Defense's um, danger zones and restricted areas if it comes up. Let me toggle it off and on again. We'll see if it shows. I'll move it around. Sometimes that helps. 
There we go. Here we are. So here's the thing. We've got kind of three systems at play with what's showing without the AIS data. You've got um, traffic management coming and going from the port. You've got the potential for energy development offshore. And then we've got um, currently existing uh, Department of Defense um, needs in operating areas. This is a danger zone. And if you click in here, or you click on it, uh, sometimes it's agile, sometimes it's not. Um, the, the, the great data layer for this is simply if you click on these, typically it'll bring up um, what is the name of the zone, what's its um, citation, that kind of thing. Oh, here we go. Here it is. Danger zones and restricted areas. And this one's the uh, Atlantic Ocean south of entrance to Chest Bay Firing Range. So, so we've got this zone. And as you can see, the traffic separation scheme kind of empties ships into this zone, right? So people would have to, people would have to take a, a left almost into perhaps oncoming traffic to avoid going into this danger area if they're, you know, if they're actively trying to avoid it. So um, one of Bohm's uh, task force meetings in Virginia a couple years ago, um, it was brought to um, Bohm's and DOD's and our attention that this situation right in this area exists. And is there something that we could do um, to address it? Now, the Navy, uh, the DOD in general, um, is the primary user of this danger zone. And the Army Corps of Engineers is the owner, the, the regulatory author and, and owner um, of this danger zone. We, the Coast Guard, um, own the TSS. And of course, the BOEM um, is the, the federal steward of these lease areas. So let's go ahead and see what um, the AIS data shows us. Um, here we go, data. So this was brought to our attention about 2015. So let's see what was happening in 2013. And we'll just use cargo vessels as kind of a thing. You can see um, right here, we didn't have a complete view of what, what, what did the transit look like approaching. This is one of the key reasons um, um, Nick and, and, and the team were able to, you know, added, um, added south of, of the border so that we, because this is a system of transportation um, is great that we could add the AIS data south. But even here, you can see that folks are coming up um, through the Kitty Hawk wind energy area and, and, and then hanging a left. Um, you know, they're, they're following these, these lines in to come in to avoid this, um, you know, this, this horn that shoots up at the um, exit area of the TSS. So the Virginia uh, Maritime Association wrote a letter to, to Navy saying, hey, is there anything we can do about this? Is there a way that we can kind of maybe lock this off or change how this thing is, is um, shown? Because with the addition of the, of the Kitty Hawk Wind Energy Area, and let's, let's see what it looks like now in 2017. You can see a more complete transit up, um, or, you know, and, and, and back. Uh, if it, but you can see how coming through Kitty Hawk, if, if people don't want to transit through this, they're going to have to, you know, skirt along Kitty Hawk, hang a right to come up, and then hang a left to come back in to enter the traffic separation scheme. And so um, VMA wrote that letter. And now um, we appreciate the efforts that uh, both DOD, or both Navy and uh, Army Corps are doing to, um, to, to address it. So, so they're looking into it, and, and we hope to see some kind of change on the chart that will make the industry a little bit more comfortable about coming through here, especially if they start developing Kitty Hawk. Because we don't, we don't want to have to add too much complexity to people coming and going. Now, this is lots and lots of room. This is, you know, 100 miles. No, not 100 miles. Uh, this is, what, 20 miles, 23 miles from shore to here. This is probably about 30 miles. But anyway, lots of room to maneuver. But even so, why add this distance if they can just do a, a straight shot up? Right, why have to go around? So that's one thing. Um, we can use the data to show really what's happening. Um, so it was brought to our attention. 
and, and we could actually see, yep, people are um, coming up to avoid this area. All right, so that's um, another example of how we could use the AIS data. Let's go to um, AIS demonstration number five. This is a unique little beast. So we talked about uh, traffic separation schemes um, already twice. Once down at the entrance to Cape Fear, once at the entrance to uh, Chesapeake Bay, and now here. Now TSS is um, kind of like lines on the road, tell you where you're supposed to be uh, and, and what side of the of the of your traffic system. Um, for waterways, it's not really a requirement. It's not mandatory that you follow it. It's more of a, hey, look, we recommend that you or Maybe you should instead of you shall. So um, it's not required that people follow this scheme. As they're coming up from the Hampton Roads area and headed to Baltimore, they follow this and, um, you know, on the way up. And then on the way back, that they follow this down. So, so it's there. It exists on the chart. Um, if we turn on routing measures and we've got it on cadaster, uh, and, and, and in the in the, in the portal, um, so, we, so you can you can see it there if we, it would, but but it exists in the charts. Now mo most of the time when you look up TSS's traffic separation schemes, if I say TSS, I mean traffic separation scheme. Most of the time, when you look them up in the regu regulation, or you look them up on the chart, you can find a similar one in the regulation. So. Um, we initially instituted these by writing letters to NOAA and followed up with rulemakings to actually add them to federal regulations. But this one is inshore, and, and, and the traffic separation scheme is an international system that's agreed to at the international maritime organization level. And so anytime we want to add or take away um, a traffic separation scheme, we get approval from the international maritime organization. But because this is interior, this is in the Chesapeake Bay, I don't think we actually wanted to, um, and, and, and this is speculation, I don't know truly the history, but I think we wanted to maintain um, authority over this so we, so we don't have it in the regulations. You're not going to find this in 33 CFR 167. So um, it came to our attention a couple of years ago at one of the Harbor Safety Committees up in Baltimore that, hey, look, you know that traffic separation scheme um, down uh, at Smith Point? And you know how you, how you don't give us tickets if we don't really follow it? Well, we don't really follow it. And we said, what? Why, why, why not? And if you look at the data, um, they say, and they said they haven't been doing this for years. So let's look at, at, at the earliest. You can see, you can see that um, some people follow the, you know, the, the, the northbound one, go off to the right and follow it up. And some people follow the southbound one. But then there's this, this trouble area right here. And it might be easier to see if we switch the base map to ocean. Um, and let me turn on, let me turn on the routing measures. There we go. And you can see this, this dense area right here from 2011. Now you'll find that it is, um, hasn't really changed much over the last, you know, six years. Here we go. You can find that this is uh, uh, trafficked right through here. And, it, and if you're going to cross a TSS, you're supposed to cross it as perpendicularly as possible, not oblique entrances to it or from it. You want to enter straight on, and if you're going to cross, you want to, you want to cross as perpendicularly as possible. So right now we have to figure out do we still need this traffic separation scheme? If, if we zoom out, you can see where this thing is. It's right, it's right immediately south of where the Potomac River um, meets the Chesapeake Bay. So if you have traffic from the Potomac coming into the Chess, and, and you have kind of a turn in, in, in the traffic scheme, it may be good to have uh, north and south lanes in the area. But given today's technology that we didn't have before with AIS and other things, is it really needed? So we can take a, a look at a couple of the different, let's take a look and see what um, passenger vessels do. Well, they seem to follow this north-south route um, more than pretty much anything else. 
Um, let's take a look at um, look at tankers. What are they doing? Seems that tankers like to hang actually to the west, and then they use this west route. So it may be that we need to revisit the purpose of this CSS. We could perhaps um, because it, if it's not being if it's not being used the way it was designed, then maybe we need to change it to to make it useful for today. So um, we could maybe cut off, maybe cut it off uh, where we don't have that top um, zag to the to the northwest. Let's shut off the routing measures. And um, here's one of the things I was thinking maybe we could do with it. And just have the bottom part of the TSS. Just keep that. And then people can come and go as they please. Now let's take a look at the data, turn it back on to cargo vessels. So maybe this is, maybe this is an answer. Or um, I created a, a kind of a straight and narrow one. If people want to, and really these probably ought to be parallel, but um, what is apparent and what the pilots, the Maryland pilots brought up to us is that at least what we've got working right now. Uh, let me reset this. It isn't working, and so we need to take some kind of action. Because this, um, because this existed before uh, the U.S. ever really signed on internationally, um, we sent a letter to NOAA back in 1968 saying, hey, will you chart this? Um, we don't have a regulatory mechanism to take it off. So we're figuring out how are we even – what what rules instrument are we going to use um, to fix this? But we'll figure it out. And, and AIS was helpful for us to, to figure out what were the pilots talking about. So that's another, another way um, of using the AIS data. Let's go on to number six. So this is the entrance to Delaware Bay. And Delaware Bay is where we've got a lot of tank ship traffic. But I don't really want to talk about tank ship traffic. I want to show you how the AIS data, sometimes we, we can get caught in our own definitions of what a vessel type is. So when you think of a cargo ship, I think of container ships. But it could be a bunch of other things. Um, it could be a break bulk. Uh, ship. It could be um, a smaller um, vessel that uh, carries, um, you know, it could be a tender to, to bring stuff back and forth uh, between ships. It could possibly be um, um, a, a research vessel that's not um, fully researched. It could be other things. So, so anyway, um, I want to show you what, what it looks like. Um, for, for passenger vessels and what, how you can see all the different things that could be passenger vessels. So remember, here's our TSS coming into Del Bay. Um, this is a ferry route from Cape May to um, Toulouse. Uh, this is an anchorage area right here. And let's turn on passenger vessels. You can see that there are there's a lot of passenger vessel activity right here at the entrance of the bay. You've got the ferry route, because we saw the dotted lines, right? And you see, um, you see them coming and going. Here's their, here's their home port. And they come out here. And, and, and if you're heading to Cape May, they go this way. And if you're heading to Luz, they come back this way. It's kind of a fun ride. There's a lot of um, passenger vessel activity here. And these are most likely um, you know, kind of your, your dinner cruises your whale watching boats, you know, that kind of thing. But then there's this. And, and they're just heading out to the anchorage. So this passenger vessel could be the, the vessels that bring, um, that bring pilots out to um, tank ships that are waiting to head back up. Or it could be um, uh, vessels that change out crews. So, um, you've got people who, who uh, are, are, are um, taking over for crew members uh, or crew members leaving. 
um, and they shuttle these people back and forth. So they're different. So when you're when you're looking at an AIS vessel type, um, whether it's cargo fishing, pleasure craft, even though it's a type, there there are a number of subtypes in each one. So it almost you, you kind of have to look at the context, where you are, and and what the waterway users are before you make your decisions using the AIS data. Um, and then finally, I have one last one last thing I wanted to kind of show you real quick. And, and let's go back to our original view of the eastern seaboard. And I want to change it from the base map um, to ocean, because it'll be easier to see this. And then let's just um, let's go back to the news data and layer all the towing vessels from 15 to 17. See how they layer up. So um, we are entering the era of wind. Uh, why don't we turn on the, the wind layer again? Let's see. Let's go to renewable energy. Turn on our... Okay. So we're in the era of wind. And in this era of wind, um, if you look at the Gulf of Mexico, uh, the, the Coast Guard's got a system of fairways where um, we, we... Actually, back in the day when they were created, Army Corps was protecting navigation. Um, to, you know, to provide uh, a way for ships to come and go through uh, the the um, the growing offshore oil uh, industry installations, and and similarly, the Coast Guard is looking at perhaps creating a system of fairways along the Atlantic coast. We're, we're considering it. We haven't taken any kind of um, regulatory actions yet, but it, as we do, I think you know we're going to be looking along these areas where, where the towing vessels go to help us figure out where these um, fairways should go, right? But as we do that, it's just as important, in addition to looking at where the towing vessels go, it's looking at where the towing vessels don't go. I think as we layer this, and it, let's, add, let's add more. Let's add, um, you know, let's put 2011 on. The, the white spaces still persist after year after year after year. So there's got to be a reason for them, right? And, and as we put in, you know, as we try to design a fairway system, I think it's important that we keep in mind uh, these white spaces and try and figure out why they exist and how they would affect, affect safe um, transportation. So what we could do is change back to the nautical charts base map. And then we can zoom in and take a look and see, uh, look at this, the blackfish bank here, a winter quarter shoal here, there's a buoy that's marking something here. And as we go up, it looks like it says fish haven in here, great gull bank over here. So right, so I think it's important for us as we design these things if we take a look at the white space, the white spaces is just as telling, I think, as the dark spaces. And, and we get these insights from looking at the AIS data. So, all right, I think those are the things that I had um, on mind today. Were there any questions that came up? Any thoughts, um, ideas? Yeah, well, let's, let's, first of all, thanks for that, Doug. That was super interesting. Um, Anyone out there have a question? And if, if so, feel free to just type it into the chat, and I'll read it out loud so um, everybody can hear it, and uh, including people who watch this webinar at a later time. <clears throat> so, Doug, did anything surprise you from seeing um, the new categories that were added in for the 2015, 16, and 17. Well, yeah. Let me uh, let me take let me take the data off. Um, there's uh, there's wind energy in addition to the um, in addition to these. Off of Atlantic City, um, there's 
there's a, uh, a small uh, kind of w wind area that could be developed um, by fishermen's energy or whatever um, took over for fishermen. Mm -hmm. um, and so I saw something that was interesting. Let's take a look at the cargo vessels. Uh, here's the wind energy areas, right? And then um, I think Fisherman's is going to be developed here. But there are all these kind of back and forths in here and back and forths in here. Yeah, and it, it's like a grid. And I, yeah, and I wonder, what are they? It's not, you know, the wind energy areas out here proper, and then the other Atlantic City one was, you know, kind of, kind of in here, I think. But... Um, the grids don't seem to match up. So I, I, so I wonder what was happening out there. I thought that was interesting. Um, w when, you look at the, when you look at the data, there, there are little anomalies that pop up here and there, and, and you're interested in finding out what they are. Here's another. Let's take a look at the tug and tow. Shut up, Christine and Taylor and uh, and from Boehm just typed in that she said that she thinks it looks like a hydro survey. That's what I thought, too. But I wonder... I wonder who's hydro in there. It could be. It could have been Noah, right? Maybe or or, or a Noah um, or a Noah or Army Corps, um, you know, contractor, just to fill out um, chart data. I don't know. I thought it was interesting to see that. But and that's what I suspected too. Is some kind of surveying. Here's kind of an interesting thing. Do you, do you remember what was in this area in here? What was the anchorage? Right, and we saw we saw all those passenger vessels coming out to service the vessels here. Well, towing vessels come in here too, and and um, these towing vessels come to uh, do a number of things: provide provide fuel, supplies, you know, that kind of stuff. So um, I, I thought it was really interesting that they were coming into the anchorage area, but it makes sense that they're here. I, I actually called up to um, Sector Del Bay, said, "Hey, look, what do you guys think this is?" They said, "Oh, it's just." Uh, just the towing community um, servicing the, anch the anchored boats. Um, one of the other things that I think is useful uh, for, and, and this gets to my world of work, um, is the pleasure craft location. Really, this, um, the New Jersey Intercoastal Waterway, um, really, it's the, it's, the rec it's the recreational boating community that uses it more than anybody else. You can turn on tug and tow, and you'll see that um, you know a little bit around Atlantic City, um, a, a little bit in here, but um, the real users are are these guys. And it and it, I don't know, you know, there's not a strong industry collaboration that can advocate for these guys and advocate for their navigation safety. So I, so I'm very mindful. Uh, of them, um, and, it, and uh, you know, our our work in keeping the channels marked, um, and hopefully our advocacy as change happens uh, for safe navigation in, in areas like this and in the changing bays and stuff like that. So um, it's interesting to me to see um, who really uses the small inlet, and the other the other demographic, then that uses them are these guys, the fishing vessel communities. And you can see where, where so maybe, you know, the fishing vessel communities come out of Abscon Inlet um, right here, uh, just above, uh, what, is it Wildwood is up here? Um, I've got a question, Doug, from Colin Moore, who asks, yeah. can, you, can you take a cut across a traffic lane and get a probability distribution? Um, so let's see. Let's um, let me shut this off. Let's turn on. Let's sh and let's change the base map. And let's turn on our our traffic lane. Uh, on routing measures. So uh, so there's. This could be considered a traffic lane, right? And then let's also turn on maintain channel. So this is what the Army Corps of Engineers maintains. So this is this is the the heart and the 
the heart and soul of getting the tankers and other vessel traffic, deep draft traffic, up into Philly and, and Marcus Hook, New Jersey and all that, and, and, and Delaware City. Um, so let's turn on turn on tanker and let's zoom in. So um, from the Marco data portal, you don't have you don't have that. You can see it. You can see. Okay, well, it looks like um, the very center. They're using the very center. Most of them you know, entering, and it pretty much looks like the very center leaving, right? But you can see kind of the, the, the density drops off um, as you go either way of center line. So there's that, so that tells that. And then, of course, um, and of course, as you, as you go in here, that you, you see how, you see how dense it is once you hit, once you hit the uh, maintain channel. But that kind of, um, this is simply observation, right? We don't, we, we can't measure across here and get um, zero percent, three percent, seven percent, fifteen percent, fifty percent, you know, and, and work our way back down, right? We can't get that kind of sophistication from the data portal. You'd have to, you'd have to have um, other analytics that are provided by um, software packages that this doesn't provide. Okay, and we have a, another question here, Doug, from Peter Taylor, yep. who asks, in your first example, um, can you give an example of what you would um, you'd be looking for that might suggest that a change might be needed in terms of waterways management? Mm. So um, um, one is the example we gave, the example we gave for that traffic separation scheme, that's, a, that's an easy one. We know we need to fix that. Um, waterways management. Let's take a look. Um, you know what would be great is if I had. Let me see if I can turn on aids to navigation. Mm -hmm. All right. Let me go down to maritime. Aids to navigation. All right. We've got a bunch of. And let me shut off. Transit count. Right beneath 2017. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So we've got coastal aids to navigation, buoys that are along um, the coast. Now, it's hard for me to tell from this. Maybe maybe we go back to nautical chart. Um, The way people navigate is so much different today than it is um, when the aid, you know, when our visual aids to navigation system was born and developed. So we used to have light ships out um, offshore, and then um, we were able to change those two structures, and then we learned how to make satellites and do um, uh, satellite navigation. And then we were able to make ships talk directly to each other um, by machine rather than having to talk to each other by voice. Now, they're still supposed to talk to each other by voice, mind you, but the AIS um, it was originally developed to be a collision avoidance tool. So, um, but, but the AIS works because GPS works, right? So to have a, a satellite positioning capability takes away the need for um, a lot of our visual aids to navigation. So we've got... Let's turn this back to oceans. It's easier to see. We do have aids to navigation along the shoreline that are that are ours, federal navigation that are um, that kind of mark. Uh, okay, you're you're this you're this far along the coast. Oh, hey, you're you're this far along the coast. You really aren't needed anymore um, because for the most part, the people who are out offshore this far have GPS and know where they are. So unless we get the big solar storm, there really isn't need for these aids to navigation. So that's um, an example of how we could use, um, I don't know if that really how if AIS shows it. Um, I don't know if AIS shows that. Let's take, um, mm, 
the the Pamlico Sound one definitely shows the need for. Uh, I'm sorry, Oregon Internet. Where's my Three. This one definitely shows how the, AI, the AIS can show us where are the ferries going. So after Florence rolled through, um, after Florence rolled through, not only did we want to reconstitute the entrances to Moorhead City and in the entire in the entirety of the Cape Fear River, our third um, top priority was getting the ferry systems back up and running. Um, now, we already knew where the ferry systems were because uh, we had been marking them. As, as, as a storm rolls through and it changes the topography, we work very closely with the locals um, to figure out how do we remark it. We're, not just the locals, but with Army Corps and NOAA on how do we remark things. So we, we really don't use the AIS data um, to remark waterways. But when it comes to long-term funding, the AIS can help um, show the story. So let's um, go back to passenger vessels. Right. So, um, it, so the real question here is, do we dredge? Do we, as in, you know, we the taxpayer pay the money to, to continually dredge here? Or do we, the taxpayer, continually fund the extra cost? To go all the way around here. So um, the, we don't. We'll we'll manage the waterway more um, tactically by by that sort of thing. What we will use the AIS data for is as wind energy areas come online. Um, it helps us to characterize what vessels are coming and going, who uses our waterways. And what are they using the waterways for? It helps us figure out um, what's the impact going to be as development happens. Do we need to reshape things? And then do we need to change our um, navigation system? It's not, a, it's not a good answer. I wish I could have told you that, yeah, we use AIS. We use AIS to change, um, to change our ATOM system here or we change it there. But that happens a lot more quickly than um, looking at the AIS data after the fact. All right. It's three, a little after three. Does anyone have one more question? Okay, wait. Can I do one more, Carl? Sure. And then we'll call it call it a webinar. All right, good. All right, so this <laughs> is kind of funny. Um, this up here is, oh, can we go in any further? All right, if we could, if we had a better, um, if we could get in a little bit further, we would. Your conference call will end in 10 minutes. All right, let me change this to, um, let me change this to tug and tow. So there's this little area right here that where, where you see tug and toes, they, they, they come and go here. And, and there's a little area where they, they kind of just sit around in, in this area. This area is a mooring buoy. And we had a report that there was a, a, a mooring buoy here. And nobody knew who it belonged to. So I, um, you can see it if you, if you actually go to Google Maps and, and you zoom into this area. You'll actually see a little, like a little white dot. It's a, that's the, the mooring buoy. And in our records, we had no record of it. But you can see it. And when you go into the chart, you'll see that there's a mooring buoy there. But we had no idea who owned it. We didn't have any idea who could, um, who we'd reach out to to maintain it, you know, that kind of thing. So um, we, used, we used the tug and tow AS data um, from not 17, but from, you know, 11, 12, 13, to see that the people who, who came and used it to go up the aquaquan and then come back and they come over here and they go back up the aquaquan. So the AIS data led us to um, a, a, a concrete uh, and rubble um, factory up here. And so we know that company. And they've got a bunch of mooring buoys all over. 
So we were able to say, hey, this is your morning buoy, right? They said, yep, hey, we need you to, to update your information. So that's one way we were able to specifically tactically use the AIS data for one um, type of um, aid to navigation that's out there. All right, that's all I had. Thanks, everybody, for your time. And, and certainly reach out to me if you have any other questions about um, how, how we use the AIS data or if you have ideas on how we, um, we ought to use it better. Thanks again, Doug. And thanks again to everybody who uh, came by today and checked this out. Like I said, probably by, um, certainly by the end of the week, we'll have this posted online for um, anybody to watch and for you to share with um, anyone who you'd like to see it. So thanks again, and everybody have a great day, and happy holidays.